Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, if you've picked up the newspaper or various magazines, you will see that this is a very exciting year because Brood 10, Brood, Brood X, they're designated with Roman numerals, is having a huge immersion from the ground this year, billions of periodical cicadas. And I'm so fascinated by this. I wanted, I have been reading articles for several months, but there are two in particular I wanted to give attention to. One is because I purchased uh, Jean Kritzke's book uh, and all the pictures in that book are in black and white. I also downloaded the book and the pictures are in color. And you're not supposed to take anything from the book without permission. So I wrote to the Ohio Biological Survey uh, because I took the first nine pictures from the book and have incorporated them into this talk because I have very strong feelings about fairness here. But that is a, a book that you may be interested in purchasing after this evening. The second reading that I wanted to share with you is called The 17-Year Locust, which was written by a gentleman named R.E. Snodgrass. The name just sounds like something out of Charles Dickens, but it was a real person. Um, and uh, he worked at the Smithsonian Institute. You can put this in, key this in, and you can download that book directly to your computer or iPad for no cost at all. And one of the reasons I mentioned that book is that I was frankly amazed at the amount of information that had already been compiled on the periodical cicadas. So I think you would enjoy both of those, but I want to make sure that I gave credit uh, to Jean Kretzky's first one. So let us go forth. Cool facts. There are 3,000 species of cicadas in the world. But of those 3,000 species, only seven species have synchronized life cycles. What does that mean? Many of you have probably seen cicadas at some time or another in your life. Where I live in Western New York State, we only have what are called annual cicadas and they're not truly annual but that we'll get to that later. But that means you're out somewhere and you may notice uh, that they've emerged from the ground. You'll see the holes, you'll see the exo exoskeletons on the tree. And if you're really lucky, you get to see them. Okay, that's the way most cicadas are in the world. However, there are seven species of cicadas have synchronized life cycles. That means that all members of that group emerge at the same time it is synchronized. And when it's synchronized, you get hundreds of thousands all the way to literally billions of them emerging from the ground at the same time. Where are periodical cicadas found in the world? I'm going to give you a moment to think about that. Now I'm going to tell you the answer. Only in North America and nor only on the eastern part to slightly over to the central part of North America. There is no other continent in the world that has periodical cicadas. Now, how cool is that? They get lots of attention. Magazines and television. Why? Well, we already said, when there's billions of them coming out of the ground, that's kind of an attention getter. And the males are what we call loud singers. I'm going to go into some of the history here. Um, there's been some very amusing things that have happened to celebrities and politicians um, if they happen to be in the wrong place when these have emerged. They can actually be drowned out by the males. 
we have this incredible immersion. They're around for approximately a month. And then they disappear. Now we're looking at a periodical cicada, which has a 17 year life cycle. The other one that is most notable in North America has a 13 year life cycle. And we're going to deal with that later. So you can't ignore them if you live in an area where they emerge. So I asked who this is, okay? It's a Hemiptera. That order of insects is what we call a true bug. And a true bug has a particular type of mouth parts that form a structure which pierces and then they suck fluids with it. This is in the adults. The word true bug means that it's a reference to the mouth. We've already uh, dealt with the second point that I have here, periodical versus annual cicadas, because annual cicadas come out whenever they come out. They usually come out a little later in the summer around July, but they don't all come out at once. A few periodical cicadas emerge in North America, more toward the east, every year. Why is this one special? Because there's billions of them pouring out of the ground. The immersion is already, the emergence has already begun in parts of Tennessee, because I've been keeping track. Every 17 years, brood X, brood 10, which is commonly called the Great Eastern Brood, emerges. It's among the biggest broods in North America. The sound of males can reach 100 decibels. If you live in an area where they are emerging, where you could be exposed to the males, you don't want to have your wedding reception outside. And I'm not being funny here because people actually have planned around that. When these creatures are all done with reproduction, and we'll talk about that later, they die. So there's thousands and thousands and thousands of dead bodies afterward. Excuse me, I dropped something here. Okay. Now the largest brood has a 17 year cycle. And this is 2021. This particular brood has been studied for its last 18 emergences. And so I was, I'm a retired math and science teacher. So whenever numbers come in front of me, I have to play with them. If you do the math, 18 by 17, because they're 17 years apart, is 306 years that they have been studied. So they've been studied all the way back to the year 1715 but they probably were here before then, but that's when people really started to notice them and started to pay attention. I'd like to give you a little bit of history. In 1634, there was an emergence of an insect. It happened to be this, but in Plymouth, and people called them locusts because how would they know? And of course, I think you all know that locusts are really a type of grasshopper, but that they happen to be cicadas. But people noticed that and they were very superstitious. So they, if they got sick, they said, oh, it's cause those locusts came. And they also said that if there was a war that came upon them in parts of, you know, in parts of North America, they said that was because they were predictors of war. And when we look at pictures of them, take a look at the wings. You will see there's actually almost like a W pattern. To be honest with you, I had to look hard to find that. I read it and then I went and looked and I said, okay, if you say so, there's a W there. But people are looking for meaning when they see things in their lives. In the Northeast, and I'm going to show you a map soon. 
Uh, the most common cicada, it has a 17 year cycle. The 17 year cycle means from egg to death. In the Southern states, and I'll show you that too, it's usually a 13 year cycle and that's a different uh, cicada. It is not number 10. This is what I wanted to show you because a lot of people don't know this and it helps you make sense out of this. In 1893, it was a gentleman named Charles Marlott and he is credited with setting up a numbering system for cicadas. So I didn't write everything out because you're intelligent people and you could see this. So the, those that emerged in 1873, he called them brood one and he used Roman numerals because it was common to name things that way at that time. The next year brood two, the next year brood three, all the way through 17 years, okay? which brought them up to the year 1909, right? Brood 17, because the cycle would repeat itself. So there's no reason to go past that. And I wrote underneath, and I have no idea why I wrote it in Roman numerals, but I did. Actually, there's only 12 broods. Some of the broods have disappeared. Some of them have never appeared, but he set up this system. Now, he continued this, for the 13 year cicada. So take a look, because if you're reading something, um, you need to bring this little piece of knowledge with you. For first 13 year cicadas, the first one was called brood 18, because you already have one through 17, all right? And then this continued through um, 13 years and ended up with brood 30, okay? So the one goes, from one to 17, and the next one goes from 18 to 30. And I wrote down here, because I was researching this, there's only three broods that we know about today. And we'll talk about that more later also. But this is important for you to pick up on. Then the broods have meaning too. Okay, the US Department of Agriculture uh, and other uh, departments used to collect data on cicadas. But after 1941, the US had been involved in wars and attention was focused differently. Citizen scientists and science researchers have been collecting data and information ever since. But before that, it was people that were involved uh, as government scientists. And there's actually an app that you can get. I always say, I love that thing. There's an app for that you can get the Cicada Safari app. And that enables you to put information in if you live in an area of emergence. This I love. I want you to take a look at these two maps, okay? The upper map shows the distribution of 17 year periodical cicadas in the Eastern United States. Now I'm jealous because where I live in New York State, there aren't any, but they are, there are some a little further over. But take a look at this. It's good. It's kind of a good geography lesson. Look at Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is just south of New York State, and every time you see a dot, what well, that doesn't mean a cicada. It means an emergence. So these are like um, events. You might call them each of these as an event. And we have a daughter and son-in-law who live in Philadelphia. So I'm kind of excited about that because you can see um, Philadelphia is in southeastern Pennsylvania. And boy, oh boy, they're going to get lots of them. So if you look at that first one, you'll see Pennsylvania, parts of western Virginia, down into uh, North Carolina, over to Tennessee, Look at Tennessee right in the middle there. I don't know how good your geography is, but I love geography. So I always like to study the shapes of uh, the states. So you see them in Tennessee, keep your eye on that one, okay? To Kentucky, okay? Uh, Illinois is another one, all right, that you should keep an eye on. Iowa, okay? 
and you'll see a few scatterings as you go toward the west. Now, this is the cicada that you're hearing the most about. This is where they've been found in the past. Now, I'd like you to look at the distribution of 13-year cicadas. Just take a moment. Make a mental comparison, okay? Now, obviously, you see some in Georgia, right? Some in South Carolina, not a lot, but some. South Carolina, okay? Louisiana, but look at Illinois. They've got them again. So they've got two types of periodical cicadas, right? Missouri and Arkansas. So there's some overlap, but not a lot. And a question you might be asking yourself is, do they ever emerge at the same time? And I'm not gonna answer it right now. So we're interested in brood 10, which will be emerging this year in 2021. Now, I want you to take a moment. I'm gonna give you a moment or two to think about this. If you have paper and pencil or you're good at doing math in your head, um, this would be a fun exercise for you. Go back mentally, 17 years. Okay, you are in, let's see, you are in 2004, right? Okay, so go back again. Keep going back until you get to one. Okay, when did it start? When did the work start on this? In 1902. And you're probably, some of you are probably sitting there going, huh, I didn't quite get that, so I wrote it out for you. Remember the gentleman who started this, right? He started out 1893 with, with group one. So if you start out in 1893, and you go through this all the way through, you will end up with group 10 beginning in 1902. It may have occurred before then, we're sure it did from historical records, but not from science records and not in reference to the way this was set up for study. So I'm gonna be quiet a moment again, so you think about this. And if you have questions later, I'll just go back to these and show them to you, okay? Are there any missing 17 year, year cicada birds? And the answer is yes. Brood 11 has not been seen since 1954. And it had been seen every 17 years where people were recording this until that time. Why do you think they might have disappeared? Think about that a moment or two. Why do most things disappear nowadays? Because of us. What do we do? We take the land, we take the forest, and we destroy because we are perhaps building houses or fields. We're doing what we like to call reclamation of land sometimes, which isn't always, sometimes it's destruction. So some of them have lost their habitats. There are also people who spray soil with insecticides and that goes down the holes and kills them that way as well. Why 17 years? That's a long, long time for a life cycle. If the temperature drops below 68 degrees Fahrenheit, they can't mate. So many people, I've read a lot of things about this. Many people think it's a protection, a way of keeping them going. The less often they emerge, the less the odds of, of this not working out for them. But why 17? It's a prime number. I'm sure you know this from your school days. Prime numbers 
half factors, the gozintas, as my students used to call them, of only one and themselves. And why is that important? Let's just take a moment and think about that. Suppose you had cicadas which took two years, okay? Two years, complete development, all the time. They had an immersion. And you had something that fed upon them. And it had a life cycle that took, let's say, four years. That means that every other time your two-year cicada had an immersion, whatever it was that ate it would have the same time of immersion and would gobble it all up. Whereas with 17, it takes a long time for something to occur again. This is one of the theories I think it's kind of fun to play with. But why are there billions of cicadas? What do you think happens when billions of cicadas come out of the ground at once? Think about that. Yeah, I can't talk with you, so I have to give you thinking time here. Okay. Suppose you were a bird. What would you say? Ah, oh, it's Thanksgiving time. That's what you'd say, right? All sorts of creatures come and they eat and they have a wonderful time and they fill their bellies. This is the cycle of life. Every, now, this feeds that. So one of the things that happens is there's a great deal of eating, crunching going on um, where they submerge. Therefore, that means that their life cycle affects the life cycle of things that eat them. So in order to survive, you've got to have lots of cicadas because lots of them don't make it. Also, I was going to get to this later, but I'll mention it now. When they come out of the ground, they crawl up on the nearest vertical whatever. It could be a tree. It could be a stick. But if there's nothing there, they're on the ground. So they can gob get gobbled up that way too. So that's something you might like to think about. So this is a picture of the holes. They're called emergence holes. What comes out of this hole is not an adult cicada. It is a cicada that has one more molt to do on the surface. They've been under the ground, and we'll talk about that in more detail also later. And somehow, they know it's time. And one of the funny, interesting things about them is that they, their front legs, obviously insects, three pair of legs, are like um, claws that dig the soil. They actually create tunnels, and they come up to the surface. This is showing you their life cycle. I'll show you a bit, some actual pictures in a few minutes. Now you'll notice on their back, uh, it's actually the um, head, thor yeah, thorax. The thorax, there's a dark spot. And when you see pictures of them, you will notice that as well. I have yet to find a source which seem to explain what that dark spot is or what it does, but it seems to be involved in the last stage of their development. When they're living under the ground, they go through several molts, and that's what this is showing you. I love these pictures. Take a look. Start in the upper left corner. Okay, we have an emergence, doesn't look like much. You can see the eyes. The eyes are red, by the way. They get redder later. 
there's an emergence, there's a splitting along the head leading back to the thorax. As you can see in the upper right picture, you start to see an emergence. You see the um, dark spot, the pigment spot behind the eye, and you see the eye itself. If you look going uh, clockwise, you see underneath the right corner, they're going clockwise. You will see something that has emerged which is actually white and kind of scary looking if, if you're the type of person who is scared by things like that. And as you go over to the left, you will see more of the body has come out. Now, go down into the lower left corner. The wings were hardly visible. Now, as... The adult cicada emerges, fluid is pumped into its wings. And as you go from left to right, you can see that. The exoskeleton in the second picture from the left on the bottom remains behind. I know when my children were little, they used to collect them, but those were from the annual cicadas, not from the periodical, but they're certainly cool. So then in the last two, you see it's drying off. You can actually see the wings. At that point, you start to see the color of the adult cicadas. Their body is brown to black and they have red eyes. They're really incredible. If you want to see this, by the way, and you can't go and see it, it's difficult to see it because it happens at night, by the way. That's usually when the emergence is right after the sun goes down. You can go to YouTube and uh, there's videos there of the emergence. I think you would be very taken by that. So, the question is, how do they know when to emerge? They wearing a watch? I think not. Um, the soil temperature is important, but I did read, and nobody explained this, that they count the pulses of fluid in the roots. And that gives them an indication. Obviously, they have some kind of relationship between the roots from which they draw fluids. And probably this affects the maturity. But the real question is, how is it that they all come out on virtually the same night if they belong to a particular brood? It's not that easy. Even today, people are not 100% sure. This is a picture of an adult the exoskeleton is now fully hardened. You can look at the wing veins. And if you tip your head a little bit, you can see that the wing veins do form a W. It wasn't something I would personally see right away. The body is black. They have short antennae. They do have wings. They can do a bit of flying, but they don't fly far. This is a picture of an annual cicada. Most of us have gotten to see them. The truth is annual cicadas are not even annual. They usually take up to about two years, but they come out different cicadas emerge at different times. They don't all come out in a, in a, a number of thousands of them. So people say, oh, well, they come out every year. But what it is, it's just different ones come out at different times. They're actually a little bigger than the uh, periodical cicadas, about quarter to a half inch bigger. Their eyes are brown and their bodies are kind of greenish. And you'll notice there's a green, greenish coloration to parts of the wings. That doesn't show up on all of them. Do adult cicadas feed? Some people are scared to death that they're going to come out and eat everything in sight. But they're not locusts. 
They've only come out because it's time to breed. They don't eat a thing. So, it's time for the males. And it's the males that make all that noise. Now, I found a diagram and it shows you that in the thorax, there is a particular section and um, it, they're what they call timbles. And what it is, it's a type of tissue that actually vibrates and they pull on it with their muscles and they let it go. And it makes that sound that is so absolutely piercing. And what is really cool about this, people, is that the males all do this at the same time. So they synchronize the sounds that they make as well, which is pretty cool if you ask me. So how long do they do this? A month. This can go on a month. So if this is near where a person lives, probably, probably drives them crazy. But after a month, they die. And that's when you see all the dead skeletons. All the, I'm sorry. You see all the dead cicadas under trees and whatever. And they decay. And it's supposed to be quite um, smelly. But you know what? It fertilizes the soil. Because nature returns everything to the earth. Now, there's a number of things to discuss here. I thought you would enjoy seeing an empty nymphal skin that's split. I mean, it looks just like the nymph. Of course it does, because it split open and it crawled out as an adult. That's pretty cool. I have a picture of mating cicadas. The females mate with many, many males. And each female lays up to about 600 eggs, the size of a grain of rice. To the left here, we have a male cicada. And to the right, we have a female. A female cicada is really very interesting. This is showing you a female cicada has already made it. Her eggs are fertilized uh, inside her body. That is not true in all insects. Many insects mate, but the eggs are not fertilized. They are stored. So but in this case, they are uh, fertilized when she mates with the males. Now, the book I got this from says her black ovipositor is clearly visible. But I think you have to look at this for a moment. First of all, look at her front legs. You can see they're enlarged. Then behind the front legs, you will see the other legs because of course she's an insect, she has six legs. Furthest back, it's darker, but it, I don't think it's a good picture if you're seeing this. Um, you will see a structure that sort of points toward the back. That is her ovipositor. And that is a very important and complex structure. This is showing you a diagram of a female ovipositor. The left picture is showing it shielded. She has, as part of her body structure, made out of chitin, these structures which she sends out, reminds me of a knife that you open up, and she actually causes damage to the end of young twigs. And when she gets an opening in a young twig, I mean new growth, that's when she lays eggs and she does this multiple times. This is showing you <coughs> Excuse me, please. This is showing you some of the damage that is done to young twigs. And this is showing you the browning because the chips are dying off. This does not kill mature trees. Some people feel that this serves as a good pruning because they get cut back and then they put their energy uh, into leaf growth 
or into root growth. Again, I'm not an expert on this. This is called flagging. And so you may notice this even with some annual cicadas, but you will notice that more with the periodical cicadas because obviously there's more of them at one time. The danger here is if there's very young uh, trees, very young trees can actually be killed by this. Obviously, they don't have enough uh, leaves and so forth to withstand that kind of invasion. After she lays the eggs, she dies soon after, as do the males. Now, this is after four weeks, after four weeks of mating and singing and so on and so forth. And this picture shows you uh, an egg inside a twig. Now, that twig, people, is very, very thin. It's found at the tip. So this picture does not give you a really good idea of size. But as I mentioned to you earlier, the egg itself is about the size of a grain of rice. So it'll give you a little bit of perspective. After 10 weeks, almost three months, Hatching occurs and a little minute tiny larval form comes out of that twig and falls to the ground. And it goes down into the soil. It doesn't burrow down because it's not made and it's structurally not made to burrow. But what it does, it finds a little crevasse in the soil and it goes down under that soil for 17 years. Okay, when it's underground, it feeds off roots. It does not eat roots. Somebody asked me, don't they damage the roots? No, they don't eat the roots as they go through the various stages of development. They actually get fluid from the xylem of the roots. And that is important because xylem usually consists of fluids and then sm very small amounts of nutrition. It is the phloem which stores the food for a tree. So damage to a tree is quite minimal and that's why it's important. This absolutely fascinates me. And I have to tell you why. First of all, this is a listing of broods in the years in which we know for sure uh, that they emerged. So let's take a moment so we can have a good conversation about this. You know from that one listing I showed you earlier, going across, we have brood from 1 to 10. You see I circled it, the X meaning 10. So those are 17-year cicadas. 13 year cicadas, of course, 13, you know, okay. So they go actually, I'm not going to say this correctly. They go actually from 11 up, right? Okay. But I only picked the ones where they have something in common. What do I mean by that? I circled this. You see where X is, brood 10? See year 1868, they had an immersion, right? Look at 13 year brood, 1868. That year, there was an immersion of both, very close to the same time. Now, you know from the maps I showed you that they overlap somewhat in some places, especially in Tennessee, parts, parts of Illinois. So they actually had two immersions at approximately the same time, which made the study of these very, very difficult. There was also an immersion of brood 10 in 1885. See where I marked it? And that means that it came 17 years after the one we just talked about. That's important. And then look, at 13 year brood 13, it emerged in 1885 too. This is very confusing for people to study because how do they know 
one brood from another. Genetics, uh, we're just getting in the beginning of the genetics of this. So a lot of it's based on people who do very good observation. And for a while, some people thought that maybe the broods were exactly the same broods, but then they didn't come back at the same time again. So then they found out, oh no, that must be one that is 13 years, this one 17 years. But those two particular years had them at the same time, which kind of blows my mind. I want you to think about how often that could occur. Okay, so when will that happen again? 17 and 13 are prime numbers, right? And they have no, nothing in common. There's no number except one, which goes into 17 and 13. So they will only come together every 221 years. So no human being will live long enough to see that happen again, but they can keep good records. Once in 1868, add 221 years. The next time you're going to get a 13 year uh, cicada emergence and a 17 year uh, uh, cicada emergence will be in 2089. I don't think I'll be here. Um, the other year was 1885, and if you add 221 to that, it's 2106. Well, people know that this is going to happen, but that's why good records we leave behind for people in the future. I wanted to spend some time with you on Brood X, Brood 10 in history, and so I'm going to share some things with you because they're not all on the screen. And some of these I think you will find quite amusing. Okay. 1715, I'm not doing all the years that are there because you'll fall asleep, but some of them are really interesting and relate to interesting events. 1716, Brute 10 was reported when a Reverend Sandal, uh, who preached at a Lutheran church in Philadelphia, described their emergence in his journal. And nobody knows exactly where he observed the cicadas. But this is what he said in his journal. In this month, this was May, May 9th, some singular flies came out of the ground. The English called them locusts. When they left the ground, holes could be seen everywhere in the roads and especially in the woods. They were encased in shells out of which they crawled. It seemed most wonderful now being covered with a shell. They were able to burrow their, their way in the hard ground. When they began to fly, they made a peculiar noise and were found in great multitudes all over the country. And this goes on, but that is one of the records. 1732 was the next appearance. And these were described by a gentleman called Joseph Brentnell, who was a very good friend of Benjamin Franklin's. And Benjamin Franklin knew all about these. And this gentleman also uh, took, you know, took good notes. And he said they started on May the 12th. And he said they were very strong and they started to mate right away. So now we go to 1749. This was a gentleman who came here from Great Britain. His name was Calm. And he was originally funded by the Royal Society of Sweden. And he thought they might be of agricultural interest. He also met with Benjamin Franklin, and I hope you've all heard of John Bartram, who is probably the greatest horticulturist in the history of the United States. Um, and they again also uh, took notes on this. And Calm took 
extensive notes, and he brought specimens back to Sweden for Carl Linnaeus, whom, of course, I think you all know, was the father of the um, binomial naming system. And he's the one who gave them their name in 1749, Cicada Septendisum, which means 17 year cicada. So that's where their name came from, and it took that time. In 1766, Brood 10 came back again, and just about everybody realized that it took them 17 years. At this point, they kind of accepted it. Um, in 1783, there was another emergence, um, and this was a gentleman named Benjamin Benneker. And he was a freeborn African American who taught himself mathematics and astronomy. And he calculated eclipses and planetary conjunctions. And he wrote and he collected information on consecutive cicada emergences. That's when you live a long time, you can do that. The first one was in 1749 when he was 17 and had not yet started his mathematical pursuits. But then he noticed more in 1766. And then he realized that, that it was a prime number life cycle, which probably is what has made me so interested in them as well. And then we skip to 1800, okay? That's when John Adams became president of the United States. It was a, a really rough, rough time. And uh, Indiana was defined as a territory. People at that time began to expect them to come. But at that time, there was a gentleman named Jonah who asked questions that no one had asked before. And here are some of them. Do these insects exist more than 16 years in the ground? in the state in which we see them and then force the way out? Good question. Are they not male and female? Some of them are furnished with stings or darts a half inch long. And those are of course the ovipositors. He asked, are they peculiar to the middle states? He asked, is the same insect found in other parts of the world? And we know that the answer is no, there are cicadas, but not periodical cicadas. And he also asked, are they not an entirely different species than the large locust? Because people did not know the difference, some of which are found every year. We skip to 1817. Um, at that point, they saw locusts as well as cicadas and were very confused because they were both emerging uh, sometimes near the same time. So this goes forward and it's actually an incredible thing to keep up with. I wanted to jump without, because I don't like reading to people, I wanted to jump to 1902. Root tens next emergence was critical to the mapping of efforts. Remember I said about group 10 and group 13 had emergences at two times that were the same time. And that was when they realized that they were different broods. Before that time, they were not sure until 1902 because now they had data. Okay, um, there was one more I wanted to share with you, if you give me a moment here. Oh, yes. 1970. You good folks should appreciate this. When the cicadas emerged in 1970, the nation was in the midst of the Vietnam War. Nixon was president and the Kent State Massacre had happened just 10 days earlier. Cicadas were screaming during the graduation at Princeton University in New Jersey when Bob Dylan receives an honorary degree. 
He was clearly uncomfortable, and he amused his guest, David Cassidy, who was laughing in the front row. Dylan was so inspired that he wrote a piece of music called Day of the Locust. And he said, oh, the benches were stained with tears and perspiration. The birdies were flying from tree to tree. There was little to say. There was no conversation as I stepped to the stage to pick up my degree. And the locust sang off in the distance. Yea, the locust sang such a sweet melody. Oh, the locust sang off in the distance. Yea, the locust sang and they were singing for me. Some people, I think everything's about them, but I think their place in history is an interesting one. So I would love to hear your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Carol Ann. That was fascinating. Uh, we do have quite a few comments in the chat box, so um, feel free if you have questions, additional questions to can type I read, in. The can, can I read them from the chat box? Sure. Like play you, yes, okay, you definitely may. Okay, let's see what we have here. So should I not play? Well, I don't know where you live, Nina, but if you're in an area where there is an emergency expected, the answer is no, you should not plant saplings this year. Okay. Ah, that's an excellent question. If adults don't eat, how can they lay 600 eggs the size of a grain of rice? 600 grains of rice would be much larger than the insect. Um, they pull fluids right out of her body. Uh, at the end of this, it's all compacted. Her body gets absolutely filled with eggs and they floop. Uh, pull what we would call like lymph, uh, it's called hemolymph, if I remember correctly, in insects right out of her body. And she's literally left uh, with a, a shell because she drops right to the ground as soon as she gets done laying these eggs. That's a very good question. And it's something I should have addressed. Per my question, it seems like reproductive overkill. Well, all I can say it's what you said there, but who am I to question nature? Um, while we, we talked about this, it's part of the grand cycle. I don't know what to say. Okay, what effect that will change soil climate? That is a good question. Uh, the Asian jumping worms tend to uh, chew through the soil itself. As you, I'm sure, already know, they change the structure of the soil. I don't have any idea what effect they would have on the survival of the nymphs, but I know that they're really not getting their nourished from exactly the same source. Are the expired cicadas eaten by anything? No. Um, they're in pretty tough shape when they fall down to the ground. And it is my understanding that it smells pretty bad, but they decay um, as everything else goes back to the earth. So do they. Are there other questions, uh, Chrissy? I don't know how to go to them if there are. Um, well, there was a question from Maureen before her uh, okay, follow up about reproduction. Should I go back? Huh? Go ahead. Um, it says, what is the benefit of a female mating so many times? Uh, because they're just now starting to do studies I understand from my readings uh, about genetics and the advantage of mating with many males is to, of course, improve outcomes. There's also something I did not mention. There is a fungus which does attack cicadas. And when I was looking online the other day, there was somebody who was trying to figure out why some cicadas are resistant to it. So anything where you have multiple matings increases the gene pool, so to speak, and makes an outcome better later on. Okay. Are there Thank any you. other questions? Um, does anybody have any additional questions? 
something you'd like to ask, you can uh, you can unmute if you have one. One new message it says here. Yeah. I have two fly fishing. Oh, a person has story. Uh, Tracy, Tracy has a story. Can we, I, can I, we I, just, I just unmuted uh, in... These were obviously not uh, periodic cicadas, but uh, uh, in February of 1974, I was fly fishing in New Zealand and there was a tremendous, we call it hatch as a fly fisherman of cicadas. And many of them were landing on the stream and a huge trout were feeding on them. They were a little smaller than the cicadas that I'm familiar with around here a little darker color and a much higher pitched sound. I went back to the motel room that night and tied imitation flies and caught the largest fish of the trip on, on one of those imitations of those cicadas. Uh, as soon as they plopped on the water, the, the fish gobbled them up. I bet they did. <laughs> about that's, a cool, that's a cool thing to see. Where were you in New? You were in New Zealand. I was in. This was on the South Island of New Zealand. Oh, then I, I yeah, I've been, I've been, to, I've been to New Zealand. I love New Zealand. Beautiful country. And, and this was in the seventies. How wonderful! That, that, February nineteen seventy four. Wow. Uh, uh, which would be kind of comparable to our August here, uh, late summer. Um, yes. And uh, about two years after that. I was fishing the Yellowstone River north of uh, the park. And uh, I heard cicadas that sounded a little different than the cicadas at home. Yes. And, and I was looking for cicadas on the water to see if the fish were feeding on them and so on. It turned out what I thought was cicadas were rattlesnakes. And I had never heard a rattlesnake before. <laughs> it, sounded, it sounded enough like a cicada, and after the experience in New Zealand, I thought uh, perhaps it's the cicadas here that sound, sound a little different than those in upstate New York. Well, they do, because there are different species of cicadas, uh, but except for the ones that we have, in, you know, the so-called eastern or middle uh, United States, Otherwise, they're what we called, I hate the term, annual cicada, but that's what they are. I, I saw a question here, another one. Thank you. I love people who share stories anyway. Thank you. How long will they be calling for? They call for about four weeks. Somebody asked that question. The cicadas, about four mm -hmm. weeks. Right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Yes. Someone lived through the last emergence in Virginia. Where do you live in Virginia or don't you? You're David Shepherd. No, not anymore. Um, we it was it was one of the thirteen year broods. We lived down near um, Norfolk, down near down in southeast Virginia. Uh huh. But, but uh, I used to bike between Richmond and Williamsburg at that point. Oh, and, I know where you are. Yeah, we have a daughter who lives near Richmond. Yes. Okay. And the year they came out, it sounded like a bad B science fiction movie. Yes. <laughs> it, was, it was hilarious. Mm -hmm. And of course, they what were a, all over. I know. Isn't it amazing? Thank you very much. Anyone else? Carol Ann, there's another question from Colette that came in at the, at the end. Are there any areas that are protected for the cicadas? Not that I know about. I was look. That's a good question too. I was looking through that. No, a lot of people regard them as pests <laughs> because you know a lot of people. So how can I put this? They don't like things interfered with, and they're messy and they're noisy, and you know, and they do some tree damage. And a lot of people are not happy about them. I don't know of any area where they're truly protected. And that's part of the reason some of the cicadas have disappeared, um, some of the other broods. Uh, this is Tracy uh, unmuting again. I was the one who asked the question about the size of uh, 600 grains of rice being considerably larger than the bug. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering if the mating contributes to that, perhaps uh, 
the the sperm is uh, adding to well, the mass of the eggs. Yes, I know what you're saying. Uh, her body actually swells up. If the female's body actually swells after she mates. But, it, but, but, but it, without eating it, how is it swelling? I'm sorry? Well, it's, it, with, it's swell. without, without eating, how, how can her body swell? Uh, because some there is, it has to do with, I understand you now, it has to do with what we call hemolymph. They, it comes out of one organ and goes into another. And it goes into the area where the eggs are have been fertilized. That's all I can tell you because I've not seen it. But that is what happens. But just it's sort of like I, it's sort I, of like I'll, that. I'll up six hundred grains of rice, and and how, how many uh, cicada bodies does that equal? <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you because I don't know how many she mates with. Uh, there's Anyone another else? question just came in um, from Alexandra. Um, can couldn't it be related to hormones? She asks. I'm sorry. Uh, couldn't it be related to hormones? And Alexandra, if you want to unmute. Oh, okay, sure of course. Mean. Oh, of course it is. Of course it is. And we know that swelling of female bodies occurs. We know it um, in honeybees because I'm a beekeeper. And I know that when a, uh, the queen in a hive mates, her body is quite swollen. You know, so her body takes all any nourishment at all that it has in it and it goes toward egg production so mm -hmm. we would expect that here too I'm sure okay well thank you so much are there, there any remaining questions I, I, I think I believe in the law of the conservation of mass <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you very much